So if we take a look at our point fittings now, this is our motor points down at console. And as we can see, we have our lock stretcher on the front, our first stretcher and our final stretcher. So if we look at our first stretcher, we can see it's track circuited here because we have the insulations on what we call the gooseneck, which is this bend part here to give it a little bit of flexibility. That's a gooseneck. We have our insulated pieces, three of them plus the bushes that go through the middle. We have our main part of our stretcher rod or four foot rod as they're sometimes known. We have our shoes which connect them to the rail, There's two of them. And these are for bullhead, um, which have a slightly smaller foot on them. And then you have a longer one, which is for your flat bottom rail as well. Uh, different types. On modern points, you would have an orange uh, shoe there uh, for the bullhead and a yellow one for the flat bottom. Um, there's a new standard for the rods on these now and hence the colour changes. Also, you'll notice traditional bolts on these. So from these just have a um, spiral washer behind them to uh, add like a spring washer trap uh, and standard square headed bolts. These have been changed on the later installations now to have a kind of a full nut half nut which slightly is epicyclic so it locks into each other when you torque them up and then you can torque them to your 250, 200, 250, whatever your railway defines. Um, traditionally it used to be just be as tight as your spanner could get them but obviously standards are changing nowadays. Things to look out for obviously are brakes and cracks down here with age and wear and also you'll get them go on the shoes here as well this is a favorite spot where they used to break just here on shoes one other thing to look out for your front rod has an extension piece on it we call the kicker as you notice if you look down there you can just see the rod extends through and under the rail which is there now there should be between three and six more clearance here now you'll notice on this rod, there isn't actually, it's almost touching the rail. So this will be reported to the P-Way now as a P-Way action. And what that's there for is to stop this switch rail riding too high. Because if it does ride too high, the front of the train will start smacking the blade, damaging the blade. So we can't have that. You can kind of see it's slightly high there. So this can be sorted easily by lifting and packing the, the timbers. The other side, our shoe has a connection off it. This we call the PA lug. Now there are version, different versions of these. There's a thinner version, much thinner version, which you see in the, the other part of the video, is for a hand point drive. Um, that's a much thinner one. Also, this one here you'll notice we have something called the escapement on it. And the reason for that is first thing the point machine does is unlock, then drive, then relock. So there is some lost motion inside the machine to let it unlock before it starts to kick the points over. But with this type of machine, if we're not careful, you end up catching the point before it drives. So there is, a, there is lost motion on the front of that to account for that. There's quite a few different point machines do that trick. Mostly the older point machines, newer point machines, it's far more lost motion inside. So as you can appreciate this lug, again, on modern yellow stretches, as opposed to these, the original black stretches, the yellow stretches have a different head that sits off these as well. And if you try and do your drives off, mechanical or otherwise, you will find there's a problem because the rods come in at a slightly higher angle. So again, it's matching the equipment you've got to what your Heritage Railway has. Um, one of the old tricks, by the way, that used to happen on the kickers, if your kicker started to get very close to the head of the rail, was to loosen the bolts and hammer it down. But if you drilled your holes right, that shouldn't happen anyway. And in the old days, what used to happen is the P-Way used to have a drilling chart for each of these ro rods. So they would pre-drill them. Nowadays, we do our measurements, we set them up and then we put these rods in. This is our back stretcher, our second stretcher. We only have two on these points, uh, B-switch, I think. And a minimum of two is a requirement on set of points anyway. Now you'll notice one thing here. All our insulations are down this side here, this right-hand side. However, because the front rod, you couldn't turn the insulation around the other way, it would bind against the timber. This rod has been matched, and you should have all your insulations on the same side. But again, you'll notice now there's a problem with the back rod. The back rod starts to get pretty close. So the timber has been chiseled out 
to accommodate that. Really, that could have been turned around the other way, it wouldn't have mattered. So our back rod doesn't have a kicker on it. This one does. These are the problems with the Heritage Railways. You end up with second-hand stuff and you use what you can. So it won't hurt to have a kicker on there. It just stops the switch riding up, which is a good thing because here it's actually nice and level. So it has worked in that case. But a small bit of a P-way issue there at the front, easily sorted out. Those are your standard four foot rods. Now in the old days again, all we used to do, we used to go to the back stretcher, which in this case would be this side here and that stretcher there. And we would take our FPL gauge and we would put it down there and make sure that we have a minimum clearance there. Now, depending on the rail type, uh, RT60, more modern rail, has a 60 mil clearance, 113 pound, etc., 110 pound, uh, 95 pound um, flat bottom, you want a minimum of 50 mil. Now your FPL gauge is 50 mil. So as long as you can slip your 50 mil gauge in there, you've got some clearance. If you can't put your 50 mil gauge in there and it's, it's touching up, what happens is the back of the train's wheels as it comes through starts to smack on the back of the switch, bouncing the switch in and out. And you end up putting pressure on the gooseneck and eventually it will crack. And it'll either crack there or it'll crack here. That's why we check for the wear on them. So if you look on the back of your switch, you shouldn't see much wear marks on the back, and there isn't, which is a good thing. So you've got to be careful of this freewheel passage, as we call it, and also freewheel clearance. And nowadays on the national network, we have a gauge that we actually put across the track that tells us our freewheel clearance, freewheel passage. Uh, switch opening is also an important thing. Um, depending on the points that you're using, nominal 108 mil opening it can go from 102 up to 120 depending on what points you're on uh, and even worse if you're using slips and switch diamonds they're down into the 90s then 92 95 96 mil it just depends on your switch openings and there are charts for setting them up as well but when we set up our rods traditionally lock stretcher then the back stretcher that should give you your good opening then you go back to setting your front stretcher so if you had say a c or a d switch which is longer than this and you had three or four rods on it Lock stretcher first, rear stretcher at back, then start setting your other stretchers up in the middle. And that's how you would set them up. These are the adjustable yellow stretchers, and there's also red ones as well. Uh, these are the chorus ones, and just something you have to be careful of on here is the weld points. So you have to check these weld points and clean this down to make sure that there's no visible cracking in the weld points there. Um, there is a rubber bush which provides insulation on both sides, so this side and that side. These rubber bushes can become unduly squashed over time, so they need checking. Um, locking nut and main nut. Square bar that you can attach your large spanner to and pole to prevent that from moving whilst you set these up. And general maintenance on these, either run the back nut up, make sure it's greased behind it before you put it in because guaranteed if no one oils it you'll never get the nut off again um, you will notice there is captive nuts to the head these do make life very interesting for trying to tighten because you can't get in there with a spanner so you need to check the backs and that's how you check them and again they do tend to tilt and pivot depends on how the switch is creeping etc so you may see movement in them one thing to check for and this is a favourite of mine the amount of ballast that builds up behind these rods that then jams the switch up when you want to try and move them over. Because the one thing you will notice is the adjustable nut goes out through the back end. 